Hey guys, it's me, Mr. 250, and welcome back to Banshee's Last Cry. We're in the lounge. This is after we talked to everybody and came to the basic realization that we don't know who the murderer is, but our best chance here is probably staying together to keep people from dying. A hush descended over the room. Here and there, upturned eyes sought each other out in silent communication. I had tried hard not to say the wrong thing, but I could see my words had only led to more doubt and distrust among her small group. I wondered if I had said too much, but I didn't feel I was wrong. As a practical matter, it was completely possible that Faberge or the three girls killed Abby. None of us could rule that out. Earlier, when we heard the sound of breaking glass, Faberge and the girls were all in the lounge. They didn't have an opportunity to kill Mr. Jones, and even if they had, they certainly didn't have enough time to dismember the body. That meant that neither Faberge nor the girls had murdered Mr. Jones. But just because they hadn't done that didn't mean they hadn't killed Abby. But even so, they didn't know her, so it was hard to imagine they would have a motive to do something like that. So who could have? I suddenly remembered something Mr. Forrest had mentioned earlier. Mr. Forrest, didn't you say that Abby told you that there was something she wanted to check out in Mr. Jones' room? Mr. Forrest, taken off guard by the question, blinked a few times before responding. Hmm, yeah. She did say something was still bothering her. No, that's not quite right. She said, I just realized something. I want to check out Mr. Jones' room. That was it for sure. She realized something, but what? I want to check out Mr. Jones' room. That implied that she was motivated by something to do with the murder. Did she find out who the real murderer was? Maybe she even confronted the killer, or he saw her investigating the room. Maybe that's why she was killed. Come to think of it, that sounded like the most natural explanation. Of course, there were other scenarios. For example, maybe Bobby or Mr. and Mr. 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 and Mrs. Forrest. The people who knew Abby the most actually hated her for some reason. That was at least another possibility. But for the time being, I thought it was best to assume that Abby had been killed to keep her mouth shut about Mr. Jones's murder. Among all of us, only Bobby had the opportunity to kill Mr. Jones, but not to kill Abby. And only Fabers and the three girls had the opportunity to kill Abby, but they couldn't have killed Mr. Jones. A mystery indeed, is it not? What have you been muttering about this whole time? Grace looked at me with a worried expression on her face. Oh, uh, well, I, I was just thinking about the murders. Yes? And now, I'm more confused than ever. None of it makes any sense to me. What doesn't make sense? He can't be one of us. Whoever killed Abby and Mr. Jones is lurking somewhere around here. The only thing we should think about is how we are going to defend ourselves. Colleen and Amber nodded their heads vigorously in agreement. Exactly, said Amber in a rare moment of candor. We're accomplishing nothing sitting here accusing each other. We have to start trusting each other. Mr. Buchanan wasn't buying it. Amber, darling, it ain't that simple. Max boy is right. We can't rule nothing out. If we ain't careful, none of us is gonna live to see another sunrise. But sugar pie, Amber started off as if she was going to argue her point. But after looking, after taking a look at the growing anger on her husband's face, she felt silent. The atmosphere in the room was getting worse. I tried another approach. Listen everyone, I don't want to believe that people I know, even though I don't really know most of you, are murderers. But the thing is, this building isn't all that big. I glanced over at Mr. Forrest to see if maybe I was making things worse, but he didn't look too bothered so I went on. What I mean is, it's not like this is some gigantic hotel with a lot of places for people to hide. All the doors and windows have been locked this whole time. Even if you had some kind of professional thief trying to sneak in, don't you think someone would have seen him? I mean, to be honest, I don't know what to believe. I don't know if there's a maniac sneaking around like a ghost or if one of you guys who looks like he wouldn't hurt a fly is actually a secret psycho. I shook my head slowly back and forth. You act like you're the only one above suspicion. What's that supposed to mean? 
Just what I said. No reason you can't be the murderer too. But I never even went in the direction of the guest rooms after dinner. There's no way I could have killed Mr. Jones, or Abby either. I don't know that. We only have your word to go on for that. And you can't go using your girlfriend as an alibi either. She could just be covering for you. Well, if that's how you want to play it, let me tell you what I think, Bobby. Now I was really angry myself. You were the one that struck Fobbers, weren't you? He said he never saw the guy that hit him. And that makes you, the guy behind him, the primary suspect, doesn't it? Oh, come on. Mr. Forrest was the first one that found him on the ground. Isn't that right, Mr. Forrest? Huh? Oh, yeah. That sounds right. Mr. Forrest answered vaguely, a somewhat troubled look on his face. That was a surprise. When I got there, it was Bobby that was cradling Faberge's fallen body, so I assumed that Mr. Forrest had arrived later. So did this mean that Mr. Forrest was suddenly a suspect? Faberge frowned as he aimed suspicious glances at Bobby and Mr. Forrest. Please stop! Just stop it already! Colleen screamed and broke down in tears. Haven't we hurt each other enough? A guilty look passed over the faces of Bobby and Mr. Forrest. I'm sure you could have read the same reaction on my face, too. I still couldn't forget the look of angry scorn Grace had directed at me earlier. Suddenly, the cuckoo clock rang out. It was ten o'clock, and the raging storm outside no sh showed no sign of slowing down. Dang, the news! I nearly forgot to watch the news! Mr. Buchanan shouted suddenly. Sugar pie, this is no time for... At least we ought to check out the forecast. Need to get our mind off of this anyway. I certainly couldn't argue with that. Without waiting to ask anyone else's opinion, Mr. Buchanan grabbed the remote and turned on the TV. He flicked quickly through the channels until he found the news. A powerful snowstorm continues to blanket the region. Reports of traffic accidents and avalanches are coming in, but so far no deaths have been reported. At the mention of deaths, everyone suddenly looked in the direction of the guest rooms. Confidence slid after the financial report. New questions over accounting methods are being asked. And, in other breaking news, the fugitive bank robber who made off with $1.9 million after a bold midday heist from the Royal Bank of Canada is still on the run. According to witness reports, the perpetrator is said to be approximately 5 feet 5 inches with a slender build. Police continue to be on the lookout for a black two-door sedan thought to be the getaway vehicle. Grace and I caught the breaking news on the radio as we were driving here. I hadn't heard it mentioned then, so I still had no idea the robber was still on the loose. Ain't never gonna find him now, no siree. By this point, our boy's probably living it up somewhere south of the border, snorted Mr. Buchanan. I had the feeling he was doing his best to try to distract us from what was going on, so I decided to join in. You can't just jump on an airplane holding 1.9 million in cash. Wrong again, Max boy. Fitting 1.9 million in $100 bills in a suitcase is as he's fallen off a log. Yes, but... Grace interjected into our conversation. Even if he did get out on an airplane, he did get on an airplane, he can't use that money overseas, can he? If he took it to a bank, they'd be able to track the serial numbers. You're thinking like an amateur, little darling. The Canadian dollar's strong right now. Even better than the U.S., Ain't no shortage of shady folks that'd be happy to exchange him. Under the table, that is. If it was me, Bobby, perhaps as a way to take his mind off things, entered the conversation. I'd stay here in Canada. But I can see why some people might want to run south, some place where the money would last pretty much forever. Probably the smartest thing to do would be to hold up in some backwater until the coast was clear. That made a lot of sense to me, but Mr. Buchanan just shook his head. Uh-uh, no way. Small town folk, they always keep a close eye out for strangers. If you can't get out of the country, the best place to hide is in the big city. But the first thing you'd want to do is get as far away from the scene of the crime as you can, right? That's the kind of panicky thinking that gets you a typical criminal, criminal college. Most of them don't have the mental fortitude to tough it out when the heat's on. It was starting to sound like Mr. Buchanan was running a workshop on Robbery 101. But if it was a tourist spot... Strangers come in and out all the time, Grace remarked confidently. If the place is busy enough, sure. Like, say, a ski resort in the winter. At that, everyone suddenly flinched like they'd been slapped. Huh? 
Why are y'all looking at me like that? Do you think that... Forget it. It's too far out there. Stunned, I couldn't stop myself from speaking aloud. What you talking about? Nothing, just forget it. Where I come from, a real man says what's on his mind. Now spit it out, son. I looked around at everyone's face, and can tell that some of the others were thinking exactly what I was. Okay, here goes. But don't laugh. I was wondering if Mr. Jones might even the runaway bank robber. There, I said it. No one laughed. That gave me enough confidence to ask Mr. Forrest a pointed question. How tall was Mr. Jones anyway? Mr. Forrest thought for a minute before answering. On the taller side, about 5'11", I'd say. 5'11". That's too tall. The news report said the robber was about 5'5". Five five. That's too big of a difference. Still, there was definitely something fishy about that guy. He had a big ski bag with him, but other than that, I'm sure... He sure didn't look like he was here for the skiing. Wait a minute, Kay said. Don't bank robbers usually have a driver for their getaway cars? Maybe Mr. Jones was just the driver, and then the bank robber killed him in a fight over the money. Hmm, that's possible. Which would mean that the killer is 5'5 five five with a slender frame. Everyone looked around each other's bodies, at each other's bodies. No one would ever describe Mr. Buchanan as slender, and Bobby and Faber grew far too tall. The closest one was... Mr. Forrest. In terms of size, at least, he was a perfect match. Mr. Forrest saw everyone's eyes settle on him, and he put on a forced smile. Hey now, this isn't funny anymore. Trying to force a connection between something we just happened to see on the news and the murders here is pretty silly, don't you think? You got that right. Besides, Billy Boy couldn't have robbed some big city bank. He's at work here every day, right? That's true, I thought. It couldn't have been Mr. Forrest. In fact, the whole idea that Mr. Jones is the bank robber was pretty far-fetched to begin with. Mr. Buchanan had pushed me to say what I'd been thinking, but it was really nothing more than a stray thought. But Grace wouldn't let the conversation die that easily. Even so, Max, I think you maybe were on the right track. What do you mean? I mean, that Mr. Jones guy didn't look like he was here to ski. He looked more like he was trying to hide from someone. Or he was involved in something dangerous. That's what I had been thinking since the time we found his chopped up body. It was just too bizarre a crime. It was simply inconceivable that any normal person could commit such an unspeakably horrific act. The killer had to be part of some dark underworld, which meant that Mr. Jones, the victim, was also part of that world. I wanted to believe it, anyway. No, I needed to believe it. How could any sane person dismember a human body like that? I can't even watch someone get a needle in the arm on TV without closing my eyes. I wouldn't be able to cut up a body for all the money in the world, no matter the reason. Huh? That made me think. Did the killer have a reason for, for butchering the body? So let's see. To disguise the victim's identity, that would be obviously a pretty good way to do it, because... You could disguise a person's height, and I don't know what happened to their face, but you could probably disguise their face pretty well if you were to kind of dismember it up a bit. For transportation, that's another way, yeah. Out of spite, that's a little iffy. I mean, you got to be, like, pretty crazy to dismember a body just because you hate somebody. Disguise sounds pretty likely here. To disguise the victim's identity? No. If that was true, he would have cut off the head and hit it. Oh, I guess not. <laughs> At the very least, there would have been no need to chop the body up that much, and he wouldn't have left the most identifiable part sitting right next to there. My mind was like a whirlpool churning with unanswered questions, and I was drowning under their weight. Just when I thought I could see a glimmer of light above me, I was pulled under again. I knew we never should have come here. The girl started to cry again. This time, it was all three of them. Just wanted a little vacation. What's wrong with that? Just let us go home. Their crying soon turned into full-on sobbing. Staggering slightly, Colleen started to walk towards the dining room. Where are you going, Mr. Forrest asked, surprised. I thought I'd fix something to calm everybody's nerves. Maybe some cocoa. 
No, I'm not drinking it. You could be trying to poison us, Molly screamed in a hoarse voice. But Coley neither didn't hear her or pretended not to. She's not going to poison us, Molly. Think for a minute. We've all been eating and drinking since we've got here. If you really would have wanted to poison, put poison in her food, we would have been dead hours ago. I tried to keep my voice soft and low to calm the girls down. Max is right, little ladies. Y'all ain't got a thing to worry about. That's true, honey bunch. Miss Forrest wouldn't hurt a fly if it was eating her, gu her grits. <laughs> Thankfully, the words of support from the Buchanan seemed to help. All right, fine, Molly said grudgingly. I'll go with you, Auntie, Grace stood up. I have a pretty good I have pretty good reflexes, so if anyone pops out of the shadows, you and I can beat them up together. I knew it was better for Coley not to go alone, but still, I felt a little uneasy about Grace volunteering like that. If you see anything weird, just call out, okay? I asked. Grace responded with a nod and a weak yet grateful smile. Sure, you can come riding in on your right horse to save me. No one laughed, but it felt like some of the tension in the room had dissipated. Even so, after Grace and Colleen left the room and headed to the kitchen, a nervous silence settled over the room. I guess we'll have to hang out like this till morning, Bobby muttered, mostly to himself. I nodded. I think that would be best. If the killer isn't one of us, he must be some kind of magician that can slip in and out of the building with no one noticing him. Even if we locked ourselves in our rooms, I don't think any of us would be able to sleep too easy. That's for sure. But think about it. Whoever it is, if they really wanted to kill everyone, why are they taking so much time? If it was me, I would have killed as many people as possible before we put our guard up. I hadn't thought about that. But hearing him put it that way, I had to admit it was a bit strange. I can think of one explanation. Fobbers, clearly in pain, held the side of his head as he spoke. Maybe he's trying to terrorize us. Terrorize us? What are you talking about? What I mean is that maybe he hates us, or at least one of us, and just dying wouldn't be enough for him. So like a cat playing with a mouse, he wants to torment us before he finally kills us. If that was true, then the killer's hatred must be an awesome, almost living thing. What do you have to do to create that kind of hatred in another person's heart? So whoever he doesn't hate, they should be safe, right? Debbie's eyes, bright with desperation, seemed to search Fabers' face for a glimmer of hope. Good question. I will say this. When I was hit on the head, I didn't sense any murderous intent. Of course, it could just be that I was saved before everyone else came back before the killer could finish me off. Still, if I had to guess, I'd say he doesn't plan on murdering people who aren't involved. That's crap! No murderous intent? What about Abby? What did she do to deserve that? She wasn't involved in a thing. Bobby suddenly erupted in anger. How do you know that? Fabers asked quietly. Bobby's face turned a dangerous shade of red, and he raised his voice even louder. How dare you? Abby was... she was... Choking on his words, he couldn't go on. I'm sorry, believe me. I'm not trying to speak badly of her. It's just the more I think about it, the more I, I get the idea that the killer is only disposing of people when he needs to. But why? What reason could he have for, for killing Abby? At some point while Fabers had been talking, Bobby's anger had turned to grief, and fresh tears rolled down his cheeks. I don't know if it was out of empathy or maybe fear, but the girls and Amber also started to cry. Was Bobby in love with Abby? I didn't know either of them well enough to answer that. Wait, that's right. I didn't know. I didn't really know him. It might have just been a performance. He could have killed Abby, then pretended to be in love with her to avoid suspicion for all I knew. I despised myself for considering that. How did I get to the point where I was so jaded and suspicious of another human being? At that moment, I wasn't even capable of feeling sympathy for a man who lost the woman he loved. But it was all because we didn't know the identity of the murderer. Was it some random stranger from the outside? Or someone right here among us? Even the answer to that was simply question to that simple question was beyond our grasp. But wait. Something Faber said just a minute ago was still troubling me. It's just that the more I think about it, the more I get the idea that the killer is only disposing of people when he feels the need to. 
So we killed Abby because he had to. I'd been thinking about this same question earlier before getting sidetracked. Why had she been killed? Did she see something? Did she accidentally run into the killer? That's when I realized exactly what I had to do. I needed to search Mr. Jones's room from top to bottom. Abby said she wanted to investigate the room, and then she was brutally murdered. If there was a clue to be found, it was in that room. I wanted to search it by myself, but I had just finished telling the others that no one was to be alone under any circumstances, so that was out of the question. But examining the room with someone else at its own risk as well. It was possible they'd turn out to be the very killer I was looking for. So who could I trust? The answer came to me immediately, Grace. I knew that I'd be safe with her covering my back. At that moment, Grace and Colleen came back carrying several steaming mugs and trays. Sorry it took so long, Grace said as cheerfully as possible, considering the circumstances. Just a few hours ago, I thought, Abby had been the one helping Colleen carry cocoa for the guests. She had been so full of life, but now... A shiver ran down my spine. Everyone got a mug. The three girls waited and watched carefully to make sure the others drank first before taking a sip of their own. There's something magical about hot, how hot cocoa, and yes, it had marshmallows, can calm down even the most anxious heart. As I drank, I could feel the tension in my body almost melt away. I'd watched the others until I felt that they too had relaxed a little, before turning to talk to Grace. Could you come with me for a minute? Where to? I want to take a look at Mr. Jones's room. Everyone gasped and stared at me, dumbfounded. What do you want to do that for? asked Mr. Forrest. Before she was killed, Abby wanted to investigate it, right? Yes, but what does that... I'm pretty sure she thought that she could learn the truth about the murderer in there. She probably got murdered because she got too close. If I'm right, that means that searching every inch of that room is exactly what we need to do. And you want to do it? Bobby's eyes narrowed in suspicion. Yeah, why not? What if you're the killer? Where's our proof that you're not going to try to hide the evidence? N now look, there's no proof, right? Well, I'm not planning on going alone. Grace will be coming with me. No way. If you're the murderer, chances are that she's your accomplice. What if three people go? You can't object to that, right? You can even pick the third person. You got a problem with me? Bobby raised his eyebrows as if to challenge me. If it turned out Bobby was the killer, he might be the one who wanted to hide the evidence. Wouldn't it be smarter in that case to pick someone else? But if I refused to take him, he'd probably get angry and keep me from going there alone with Grace. That's true. And honestly, we don't have a ton of proof that Bobby's the murderer. And even if I did pick someone else to go, there was always a chance that they could be the one that turned out to be the killer. My thoughts were starting to run in tangent circles, so tangled circles, so I finally said, No, that's fine. Let's go, Bobby. I hadn't completely lost all my suspicion about him, but I was starting to think his grief over the death of Abby was probably genuine. Probably. After asking the others, no one had any objections to the three of us going. You ready? I drained my mug and stood up. Just don't do anything that would interfere with the police investigation, warned Mr. Forrest. I was going to try to avoid that, but since I didn't know what we were looking for, I couldn't promise anything. I just nodded, and the three of us headed towards Mr. Jones's room. As we stood in front of Mr. Jones's room, we could feel the cold in our feet as freezing air poured through the crack at the bottom of the door. So what are you looking for anyway? Bobby asked. I had no answer, of course. Ignoring him, I opened the door. It was like entering a walk-in freezer. Snowflakes were dancing madly in the wind rushing into the room from the broken window. More than half of the bed near the window was already covered in the snow. It's freezing, Gray said, already starting to shiver. I can't last more than five minutes in here dressed like this. Let's start with the bathroom. We all bolted into the bathroom like we were running from a tidal wave. With all three of us there, we were forced to keep the door open. It was a basic unit bath, slightly longer than normal. On the first inspection, nothing looked out of the ordinary. First I checked to see if any of the soap had been reused, see if the bath had been used, or checked to see if the bath towel had been used. Let's see. I think the bath towel would be far too obvious. 
So I doubt that a murderer would have, in fact, used that. Bathtub's a little iffy. I would say the soap, because if you were to murder someone like that, I doubt no matter how careful you were, you were going to get some pretty bloody hands, so you'd want to wash. First, I checked to see if the soap had been used. Its edges were slightly rounded off. The inside of the sink was wet too. It was clear that the soap had been used at least once. Hmm, that does seem pretty suspicious, doesn't it? I peeked under the sink and inside the toilet, but found nothing. Looking up at the ceiling, I saw a square-shaped seam. There was a space above the ceiling. Grace, get up on my shoulders and take a look inside, okay? Well, are you sure? I'm pretty heavy. Like what, about 170? What? Not even close! Well, it shouldn't be a problem then. I'm not that much of a whim. I crouched down, and Grace got on my shoulders. It was too bad she wasn't wearing a skirt. <laughs> but even so, I could feel her soft thighs through her jeans. Don't start thinking anything weird. Who? Me? Never, I said as I stood up. Wow, she is heavy. I thought to myself without being stupid enough to say it aloud, good job on that one. Grace moved aside the square panel above her and poked her head into the opening. Can you see anything? Nope, not a thing. Oh well, I thought. I guess there's nothing to find in the bathroom. Hey, I'm freezing over here, Bobby yelled from the bathroom doorway. Let's move it. I carefully lowered Grace to the floor and we hurried out. Next was the closet. We checked there to make sure no one was hiding there earlier, but we hadn't looked closely at anything else. I pushed the curtain to one side, and we all peered in. The only item on the hanger was a grey coat. Below that was a large duffel bag with attached wheels. I reached in and pulled it out. There was nothing inside. We searched the side pockets, but again nothing. Not even a scrap of paper. So the killer stole it, huh? Grey said. Probably, but what did they steal? Maybe 1.9 million dollars? I still couldn't get the story of the bank robber out of my mind. Where's his change of clothes? Huh? His change of clothes. Even if he wasn't here to ski, he must have had a change of clothes. You're right. Unless he was on the run, that is. If he left in a hurry, he might have not had time to pack. Meanwhile, Grace was searching through the coat pockets. No wallet, nothing. I wonder if the killer took it. Maybe he was trying to hide the victim's identity. Next was the room itself. Grace and I looked around to see if there were any personal items anywhere. Bobby stood in the corner, watching us shivering. Hurry it up already! If you want to leave, the door's right there, I snapped. Bobby closed his mouth sullenly. We quickly searched under the bed but found nothing. The only place left was near the window, where the room's gruesome occupant lay. I, I guess we'll have to search the body after all. I told myself that because my voice was only sh I told myself that my voice was only shaking because I was cold. I guess so, but count me out, okay? Trying to push the grisly object that awaited me out of my mind, I gingerly stepped into the snow-covered corner of the room. My shoes offered little protection from the snow that was already ankle-deep in some parts. Achoo! Achoo? It was just the sneeze. Slowly, I inched around the bed and peeked at where the body lay. It was completely covered in snow, so I couldn't see a thing. My momentary relief evaporated when I realized that I was going to have to remove the snow in order to investigate. Darn. Shivering all the while, I started to carefully brush off the snow. Suddenly, my hand brushed against something stiff and pointy. Human hair, frozen solid. Grimacing, I continued to brush off more snow while trying to take care not to touch the body. Finally, I was rewarded with the same horrific sight I'd seen earlier. A grisly pile of dismembered body parts. The bitter taste of bile flooded into my throat, and I had to struggle to stop myself from vomiting. I don't think Abby came to investigate this. It doesn't look like it's been... touched. So what then? Grace asked from the far corner of the room. So let's get the heck out of here, Bobby shouted. I couldn't have agreed more. And uh, we're going to stop there. So investigating the room didn't seem to yield anything. Now, maybe it's because we didn't look at the right things. I don't know. But it definitely seems like that 
The sink had been used, probably by the killer after he dismembered the body, I'm imagining at this point. He would have washed his hands and, uh, you know, wanted to keep, wanted to keep that off of him. That would be a good way to do it. The bathtub might be a little bit suspicious, but I don't know. I think the sink is a far better option in this case. Anyway, we're going to come back in a short bit and uh, we'll keep going through this. And I'm glad you guys are enjoying. I am enjoying doing this as well. Anyway, thanks for watching and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.